Hello, everyone. We are going to start our next session. This is going to be an understanding, a deep understanding of the Linux network stack overheads for high-speed networks. Uh, Shubham Choudhury and Kize are going to be our speakers today. Um, this is a pre-recorded video, so please ask all your questions in the Q&A tab and raise your hands, and we will get to it in the last 15 minutes, unless there's an emergency question that you need to have answered right away. And we'll try to get to it in the middle. So uh, here goes the video, and we'll come back and answer questions. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our talk on understanding host network stack overheads. I'm Shubham. I'm a PhD student at Cornell University. This work was done with my colleagues, uh, Chicha, Medul, Jehun, and Rachat. Let's start by looking at network and host hardware trends that motivate our work. Over the past decade, single core performance has improved by 10x while network bandwidths have improved by 400x. This leads us to present day when hardware can support high bandwidth, but our network stacks have become a bottleneck. To remedy this, the community exp is exploring a variety of options like RDMA to bypass remote CPU, hardware offloads of network processing, or even entire transport protocols to FPGAs or smart NICs, optimizing the Linux network stack further, or even completely bypassing it in favor of polling-based user space stacks. We feel the design space explored by these solutions will benefit from a detailed understanding of the existing stacks, which is what we aim to achieve with our work. For early generation data center uh, networks and the internet, the throughput bottleneck existed in the network core. Since a single CPU was enough to saturate the entire access link bandwidth, so the main challenge was in sharing network resources efficiently, like switch buffers, managing queuing delays, uh, switch bandwidth and switch contention, and so on. However, we find that that is no longer true for modern NICs with 100 Gbps and more bandwidth. A single core can no longer saturate the entire access link bandwidth. And so the bottlenecks have shifted to the host hardware, and the challenge now exists in sharing host resources like PCIe bandwidth, DRAM bandwidth, LLC capacity, CPU cores, and so on. Before diving deeper into our results, let's look at our experimental setup and methodology. We have two Intel Skylake Xeon Gold servers. Each chip has 19 megabytes of L3 cache, and there are six cores per chip. The NIC is attached to the first NUMA node, our servers have DDIO enabled by default, using which the NIC can DMA directly to the L3 cache if the address belongs to the same NUMA node as the NIC. By default, DDIO can use 2 by 11 uh, of the LLC capacity. Uh, we have four NUMA nodes in the server for a total of 24 cores. For DMA to NIC remote NUMA nodes, the transfers happen to DRAM through UPI which is Intel's UltraPath interconnect. Since we want to stress the network stack, we connect the two servers directly with no intervening switches. We run iPerf and NetPerf as our benchmarking application. They perform minimal application level processing. Our observations will change depending on what applications do, but that is out of scope for our work since we want to understand the network stacks themselves. We focus on long flows as, a port, as opposed to short flows. By long flows, we mean flows in which a large amount of data is transferred in one transaction. And by short flows, we mean flows in which a small amount of data is transferred in one transaction, like synchronous RPCs. We primarily focus on long flows since the majority of bytes in a data center are carried in long flows. Most prior work has been done on short flows, and therefore the understanding of long flows is, in, is insufficient. We measure the following metrics, throughput as reported by the benchmarking application, CPU utilization as reported by SAR, uh, CPU utilization breakdown as reported by PERF, and LLC miss rates. For our workloads, we use the following traffic pattern, a single long flow in which one application is running on the sender core and one application on the receiver core, um, 
in cast to stress the receiver side bottlenecks um, one to one. With many cores, uh, when we saturate the network bandwidth, we observe that the bottlenecks shift, and that's an interesting effect. Outcast to send uh, to stress the sender side bottlenecks, and all to all to stress uh, uh, bottlenecks in all locations. We also briefly look at the performance of short flows or RPC type flows. Uh, we also look at mixed flows, uh, which is collocating short and long flows on the same CPU core. We also attach our uh, servers to a programmable switch and simulate random packet drops to look at the effects of in-network congestion. And lastly, we, we configure various hardware properties to see their effect on the performance, like DCA, IOMMU, and so on. Because of time constraints, we focus on these four scenarios in this talk. I'm sure the audience here is well familiar with the networks, Linux network stack data path, but for the sake of complete list, let me quickly go through it. So the app generates a data packet, uh, which it sends, uh, which it wants to send to the receiver. So it does a write system call, which is intercepted by the socket API. The socket API will create the necessary packets and SKBs and then appends the packet to the socket write queue. The socket write queue is eventually processed by the TCP IP layer, uh, which, if permitted by NetFilter, uh, will go to the XPS layer where the hardware queue for transmission is selected. The packet is appended to the corresponding queuing discipline. Um, and then eventually, depending on the packet scheduling policy, it picks a packet to, uh, to send. At which point, if the packet is greater than the MTU size and TSO is not enabled, it, it's given to the GSO layer, which splits the packet into MCU, MTU ch size chunks. Um, and then eventually, uh, the queuing discipline will send all of these packets to the driver for TX. The driver creates all of the necessary mappings for DMA. And then, and then the NIC will eventually transmit the packet to the receiver NIC. The receiver NIC will uh, DMA all of these packets to the ring buffer and then trigger an uh, IRQ, at which point uh, NAPI polling will start. NAPI will pull all of these packets and then send them, send them to the GRO layer if, if that's enabled. Um, the GRO layer would co will coalesce all of these packets into one big packet. Um, and then eventually all of these packets are sent to the R RFS RPS layer, which will, which will select the CPU for TCP IP processing. And then NetFilter permitting, uh, that, uh, that packet is forwarded to the TCP IP layer. The TCP IP layer will append the packet to the socket read queue, and then wake up the application thread for doing the data copy. At this point, the application thread, which is sleeping in uh, the kernel context in, inside of a read system call, will wake up and then process the uh, socket read queue. And then the read system call will return, and then the application will have received the data packet. Talking about the main takeaways from our study, we find these main lessons that are uh, a, de a departure from the previous conventional wisdom. First is that data copy is the primary bottleneck in the end-to-end -end data path for a single long flow. This is evidenced by the fact that more than 50% of all CPU cycles on the receiver are dedicated to data copy. This is opposed to the common wisdom that packet processing is where most of the cycles go, which is perhaps still true for uh, the studies that are done on short flows. Secondly, uh, the NIC DMA pipeline has become inefficient. By the NIC DMA pipeline, we mean the pipeline between NIC DMA packets to the kernel buffers and the subsequent copy to user buffers. By changing the parameters relevant to this pipeline, we observe a 24% drop in performance between the op optimal parameters and the default parameters. Thirdly, while sharing host resources to improve utilization was fine in early generation data center and for the internet, since the bottleneck was in the network, that is no longer the case. And we see a sharp de decline in throughput per core when host resources are shared. Based on these observations, we propose two major recommendations for network stack designers. Redesigning the current network stack to enable dynamic processing pipelines, to meet the requirements of scaling different layers dynamically, and also to enable dedicated packet processing pipelines for short flows. And the second is network-aware CPU schedulers, 
to perform careful scheduling of co-located applications. We go through each major takeaway one by one and look at the evidence we have for them. We start by understanding the performance of a single long flow. Um, for 40 GBPS NICs, a single core could saturate the entire access link bandwidth. Looking at the throughput per core um, for a single long flow running on a NIC local NUMA node, baseline here means that no software or hardware offloads are enabled. We successively turn on optimizations to see their effect on throughput per core. TSO0 are the TCP splitting or coalescing offloads. Jumbo frames have an MTU of 9,000 bytes instead of 1,500. And ARFS enables the co-location of IRQ processing on the application core for better cache locality. As we see with the baseline, we get a throughput per core value of about four. When we enable TSO GRO, we get a throughput per core of about 10 gigabits per second. With jumbo frames, we get a throughput per core of about 21 gigabits per second. And with ARFS, we, get, uh, we see the most benefit uh, and we get a throughput per core of about 42 gigabits per second. The thing to note is that, however, for, uh, for, the, for the 100 GBPS, we need multiple cores to saturate the entire access link bandwidth. Looking at CPU utilization numbers, for baseline, we see that um, we see a receiver CPU utilization of almost 200%. When we enable TSO GRO, our throughput increases and our CPU efficiency also increases, uh, which leads to a greater throughput per core. When we enable jumbo frames, our CPU utilization decreases further and our throughput increases even more. And then with ARFS, our uh, CPU utilization uh, uh, is like the least of all of these four cases and our throughput increases further. The thing to note in this is that in all four cases, the receiver side is the main bottleneck as opposed to the sender side. Diving deeper into why single flow performance is as we saw, we run a profiling on the CPU cycle breakdown using perf. We find the contribution of each kernel function to the CPU utilization and classify the functions into one of seven categories. The first category is data copy, which are all of the kernel functions responsible for copying data from the kernel buffers to, to the user buffers. Next is TCP IP, which are all of the functions that are responsible for TCP IP processing. The, uh, the, the third is a net device subsystem, which includes all of the low, le low level kernel stack functions, uh, which are responsible for things like uh, G GSO, GRO, uh, and also all of the driver functions. SKB includes all of the function for SKB uh, processing, including uh, creating SKBs, destroying SKB, and so on. MM means memory management, which includes all of the function responsible for allocating or deallocating memory. Lock includes all of the function that do uh, locking or unlocking. Sched includes all of the scheduling functions, which involve like waking up, uh, waking up threads or putting threads to sleep. And et cetera is the category for all of the functions that do not neatly fit into any of the seven categories. In the baseline case, we see the TCP layer takes up the majority of CPU cycles. This is because the TCP layer has to process MTU, which is uh, 1500 bytes sized packets. So the per packet overhead is quite high. Next, we enable TSO GRO. And we see that the overhead of TCP IP layer decreases radically. This is because the TCP layer now only has to process packets of size 64 kilobytes, since GRO will coalesce the packets of uh, 1500 bytes into uh, full size, i.e. 64 KB packets. However, the cycles taken up by net device subsystem increases as it has to coalesce packets and it has to do all of that processing in CPU since GRO is a software offload and not a hardware offload. Enabling jumbo frames reduces that overhead as, it, uh, as the GRO layer only has to process packets of MTU 9000 instead of 1500. And the bottleneck shift to data copy. 
enabling ARFS co-locates IoQ processing on the application core. This means that DMA now happens to the L3 as the NIC can use DDIO, which improves data copy efficiency and the improved cache locality also reduces the overhead of memory and SKB management. Let's now look more closely at the NIC DMA pipeline. In the presence of DDIO, the data is DMA to the LLC. When the application wants to copy this data to user buffers, the copy should be fast, except if the data is not in the cache anymore, in which case the copy will be done through DRAM, which is slower. The data copy efficiency can be characterized through the cache miss rate. If the cache miss rate, miss rate is high, the net throughput is low because the data copy bandwidth is reduced. There are two parameters that are relevant to this phenomenon. Let's look at them and try to understand the reason behind the inefficiency in the DMA pipeline. The first is the TCP RX buffer size. This controls the maximum amount of data that can be in flight. As we can see, as you increase the TCP RX buffer size, the cache miss rate on the receiver increases and the throughput correspondingly decreases. This can be explained by the following. As the TCP buffer size increases, the data copy latency increases, which means that the delay between the moment when the NIC DMAs data and the moment when the data is copied to the application buffer increases. We measured this delay in Linux and confirmed that this indeed happens. In this animation, let's suppose that these packets represent some data that the NIC has to DMA to the LLC. It transfers these packets one by one to the LLC until the LLC capacity usable by DDIO is completely utilized. However, if the data copy latency was low, the application would promptly copy these packets to the user buffers from the L3. However, since data copy latency is high, by the time data copy is started, the NIC has already overwritten the packets in the cache and the data copy experiences high uh, cache miss rate and therefore lower throughput. This leads to a situation called a leaky DMA problem in Passworks. This reveals that TCP window size calculation must take system parameters into account, like LLC capacity and end host latency, and not just network parameters like bandwidth and RTT. Since the network pipeline is static and single threaded, ensured by the socket mutex lock, uh, we could potentially decrease the data copy latency by dynamically scaling the number of uh, cores uh, that, that are responsible for doing data copy for a single TCP flows. And that requires re-architecting the network stack to make it not single threaded anymore. However, even in the case when TCP uh, buffers are small and the amount of data in flight would fit in the LLC, we see a high cache miss rate. We look at the effect of uh, NIC RX descriptors on um, single flow performance. We see that as we increase the number of NIC RX descriptors, we see a high cache miss rate and correspondingly lower throughput. I.e., as we increase the number of NIC RX descriptors, there is a higher chance of cache eviction. In this animation, uh, the red dots represent NIC RX descriptors. We see that even if the, the two packets would fit in the LLC capacity, uh, the second packet has overwritten um, the previous packet in the LLC. And, 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 and when the application wants to perform data copy, it has to service it from DRAM instead of the LLC. We hypothesize that this is due to a suboptimal or inefficient cache replacement policy. While we do admit that we need a better understanding of this phenomenon to characterize it more uh, accurately, uh, we can definitely recommend uh, that the number of NIC RX descriptors should be chosen carefully to remedy this problem. And of course, zero copy techniques like TCP MMAP and AFXDP can completely alleviate this bottleneck. 
However, they both require significant application logic changes, and the latter must implement the network stack in user space to be usable. Let's now explore how host resource sharing leads to suboptimal performance. In the in-cast case, where a number of sender cores are sharing data to a single, single receiver core, all flows are sharing receiver core resources, most notably the cache. This leads to cache contention and subsequently poor performance. In this graph, as we increase the number of flows that are running on the same receiver cores, we see that our throughput per core decreases and our cache, receiver cache miss rate increases because the flows are contending for the same CPU cache. One way to overcome this issue is to perform receiver side scheduling of flows, which is currently impossible in TCP as it is entirely sender driven. However, recent work on receiver driven transport protocols by the SIGCOM community like PHOST, OMA, can allow efficient orchestration of host resources like CPU cache. That is, the problem of designing transport protocols goes from a purely al algorithmic problem of flow control and matching to a systems problem. Next, we look at the case of all to all, where there is a flow between each sender and receiver core pair. This leads to a lot of interesting effects. First of all, all flows on a single core are sharing those resources. Multiple cores on the same NUMA node are sharing the L3 cache. And additionally, since network bandwidth is saturated quickly for these many flows, they're also sharing network bandwidth fairly. Due to so much contention, we see a heavy loss in throughput per core. This can be explained by the following reasons. Looking at the receiver side CPU breakdown, we find that data copy contributes less and less to the overall CPU utilization as we increase the number of flows. And scheduling overhead increases rapidly as applications wake up and go to sleep frequently because they're sharing only a fraction of the network bandwidth. In the graph below, we plot a histogram of SKB sizes received by the TCP IP layer after GRO. We see that as we increase the number of flows per core, GRO efficiency reduces, and the fraction of full-sized SKB that are SKBs that are passed to the TCP layer reduces. This is because uh, as the number of flows on a core increases, there are lesser opportunities for coalescing packets. Also, GRO can only maintain metadata for about eight flows at a time per core. This means that the size of the packets being processed by the TCP layer increases and the per packets overhead increase in general for all layers. While we don't have time to talk about the performance of short flows in great depth in this talk, we can compare some of its performance characteristics with long flows and see what conclusions we can draw. Firstly, we, we begin by looking at CPU utilization breakdown for both long and short flows. Immediately, we see that the performance bottlenecks are very different. TCP and scheduling overheads increase as we decrease the flow size. To tackle the problem of difference in bottlenecks, we must have different application-specific dedicated packet processing pipelines for short flows. Looking at throughput numbers, we run both long and short flows on both NIC local NUMA node, so DDIO is enabled, and NIC remote NUMA node, so DDIO cannot be used, and DMAs have to go through UPI. We measure the throughput per core and receiver side cache miss rate. We see that DCA, or NUMA locality, has a huge impact on the performance of long flows. However, DCA has little to no impact on the throughput of short flows. This means that we have an opportunity to schedule short flows on NIC remote NUMA node without impacting their performance. Lastly, we look at what happens when we co-locate long and short flows on a single core. We see that as we increase the number of co-located short flows with a single long flow, our throughput per core degrades. 
and it impacts the performance of both short flows and long flows. To remedy this, we need network-aware CPU schedulers to schedule long and short flows on different cores and or nodes. As we saw from the previous experiment, we can schedule uh, short flows on NIC remote NUMA nodes without impacting their performance and without leading to interference uh, between uh, long flows and short flows. For a more detailed analysis on even more, even more workloads, please read our paper, which will also appear in the proceedings of SIGCOM 2021. All of the tools used for profiling and measurements are available on our public GitHub repository. To summarize the talk, we determined that data copy is the primary bottleneck for long flows. We can alleviate this bottleneck by having dynamic network processing pipelines that use multiple cores for data copy, for instance, or by using zero copy protocols to completely remove this issue. Secondly, the NIC DMA pipeline is inefficient. We need careful determination of software and hardware parameters like window size, NIC RX descriptors, uh, in order to uh, utilize our DDIO hardware and our NIC hardware uh, to its fullest potential. And lastly, since host resource sharing is now considered harmful, we need to carefully orchestrate host resources, either by using receiver-driven transport protocols or uh, by using network-aware CPU schedulers. Uh, thank you for listening to our talk. Thank you, Shivam. Uh, that was a very good talk. Uh, I'm going to raise the lift the, uh, the curtains for questions, but I'm going to start with a, a comment of my own. I think that statement about NIC DMA pipeline is inefficient is fundamentally, I think, a mischaracterization because everything you're talking about is effectively DDIO and LLC footprint, right? It has a different CPU architecture may not have the same impact that you're calling inefficiency and and sort of your eviction rates. I would actually call it more around, I would label that item something about LLC management is more, is very sensitive. And, and actually that depends on whether you're using an AMD CPU or even an ARM CPU or a RISC-V and, and the impact of that could be very different. Yes. Okay, um, let's uh, go, we yeah, talked about it, soft GRO, you, you don't need to talk about that. So let's go with this guy. Mike has this question. Uh, you can see it, Richard, so yes. if you can read it, just answer it on your own. And um, yeah, so as I um, so yes, we are uh, so uh, a full version of this paper is also appearing in SICOM. We have some more details there. Our uh, code is an entirely like on a public GitHub repo, and we have uh, I think a pretty comprehensive uh, README file. Um, using which you can uh, understand how we uh, measure all of these uh, things. Um, and we are also in the process of writing a tech report with even more data. So all of that uh, is, is should, should be there soon. Uh, by the way, uh, for people with the questions, if you want to follow up, just raise your hand and I'll bring you on stage and you can it can be a live session. If the answer is sufficient or satisfactory, we'll move on. Um, okay, I guess I'm going to call that a satisfactory. Uh, we talked about this. There was a question about what was the CPU model. Um, so the CPU model is um, it's Intel Xeon Gold six one two eight. Uh, it's a hexa core uh, CPU with uh, 19 megabytes of um, L3 cache, uh, 3.4 gigahertz. Um, yeah, um, uh, Skylake um, Xeon. Sounds good. Uh, let's go to the next one. Seems to be a um, question. Uh, yes. So I. Um, I remember reading in an article, I don't remember exactly which one, that AMD is planning to support some type of DCA with their Zen 3 uh, architecture. I, I don't know whether uh, that's true or whether they released those servers already or not. Uh, but yeah, probably like 
a lot of our single core analysis, which is uh, heavily impacted by the DDIO uh, performance characterization, probably um, is not relevant to AMD performance. So Christian wants to say something. Yeah, yeah. just to follow on, I because I was looking at you know doing fast packet stuff with you know AMD's and Intel, so I I, I was looking really close at this. I also found that the, the, it was very mysterious the locality of PCI routes with AMDs, right? Like they don't document yeah. it. It's really hard to know. Um, so yeah, so it, it, multiple things you're looking at are really hard to like determine or even apply on AMDs. So so two additional things, like Christian. So I think, yeah, AMD has a very deep NUMA hierarchy and every NUMA node in it or whatever they call it has its own PCI root complex. But more, an interesting question, right? Sort of a sub question, and maybe it's a question for Shubham as well to see if they have seen this. DCA is, you know, for networking benchmarking is a guaranteed win, but there are many scenarios where DCA actually is a, will hurt you, right? Because you may not be looking at the data or you may, wanting, you may be wanting to use the cache in other, in other ways, or the, the timing, the temporal positioning of the packets may not be exactly where you want it to be. Kind of like the data that they're showing. Yeah, it's very but, hard to use. Um, our, our, I, I found that with ARMS because there are ARMS that support this and, you know, just blowing the cache away. Yeah. It's not, not necessarily the best thing. Yeah. Okay. Thank Thanks. you. Uh, so I'll take that. Uh, I guess there's one more. Jesse. Okay. Um, so, um, we do think that increased uh, cache size should help um, for larger TCP buffer sizes, um, but we don't have any servers with uh, a greater LLC size, so we can't say for sure. Um, but uh, one thing that we tried in our other experiments, and we have more details uh, in our paper uh, on this, but uh, we tried to increase the default uh, DCA capacity from two to like using like a greater fraction of the cache. And that didn't seem to help as much. And um, we suspect that the suboptimal cash replacement policy is at play here again. Um, we are investigating that aspect of the uh, of this whole pipeline in um, another uh, in like an, another project. So, um, but yeah, for this exact question, I I probably, but I can't say for sure unless I like try. Okay, I'm going to, uh, one second, there's one more. And then uh, David has a, uh, I'll bring David on the next question. Uh, no, I, we ha have not looked at, um, I mean, one thing is going across NUMA doesn't give you uh, DDIO anymore. So um, that like is like a big loss. And we, we, we do see that when we disable DCA and even if we don't go over uh, NUMA, then we uh, do uh, experience like a large drop in performance. Um, I do not know. Um, we we didn't run any other types of experiments uh, like the multi-host approach for PCIe, uh, so I can't I can't say on that front. Okay, uh, we have one in-person question. David Ahern, you're up. Hey, uh, so a series of questions actually. Um, you mentioned ARFS. Did you consider using uh, steering as opposed to AR ARFS, which has its own overhead? So, um, um, uh, no, uh, we did not. We just used uh, ARFS in um, all of our ARFS experiments. But in fact, uh, we are using flow steering. So in all of our non-ARFS scenarios, we are um, steering the flows to like another CPU core to make sure that we get like a consistent performance. Um, because if we do not use flow steering or ARFS and we just use some RSS type um, experiments, then we would get like an, an uh, like a non-deterministic performance, which is yes. hard to characterize. Yeah. Um, but yeah, for ARFS, we did not compare to like just a simple flow steering case. Um, I would say disable ARFS and use steering rules in the NIC to push mm -hmm. it to a CPU. And then yeah. what about pinning? Did you do any kind of task pinning compared to yes. where the packets yes. processed? Okay. So uh, we pin each application on a specific core. So wh when we talk about single flow, we've pinned all of the, both the application on sender and receiver on, on a CPU core. And when we talk about like 
um, let's say uh, all to all, then we have pinned the applications to their like specific cores and we have okay. flows between them. And you consider um, L3 cache in relation to where both packet processing and the application is sitting? Um, so like if you're steering to a specific CPU and the packets are processed on CPU zero, pinning to CPU one, if it's a different core, but the same cache, not a sibling thread, um, you should see good good performance with that kind of uh, setup. Yes. So indeed, uh, we we did run an experiment, and I think this this result should be available in the tech report, not the full paper because we didn't have space. But we did run like uh, all like all types of um, uh, all of these different uh, permutations and combination. And what we saw was that we were getting uh, 55 gigabits per second of throughput from a uh, single TCP connection. But the throughput per core was still like around 42, so which is not any different than. Um, so you do gain in like total throughput, but you're also using like a correspondingly higher amount of cores. Um, okay. So that did not help us. Um, so like with the Ryzen box and the Connect X5, you can get in 3400 to 4000 MTU, you can do 100G flow on a single core. So that's why I was bringing that kind of a setup. Um, just, a, just some feedback. And then another one is about the existing APIs to get into the impact of the mem copy, you can do things like there's a, TC, a TX zero copy API, which is fairly easy to implement and will show, for example, with iperf3, the send file is what they have for their dash z argument. Um, the ZC API actually performs better and it gets into a little more realistic, um, avoiding the mem copies on the TX side and then you know, you could examine things like just oh, message truncate on the receive to say, well, if we disregarded the mem copies, what what can we do on speeds? Hmm. So um, we just wanted to focus on the performance of like the most common denominator, and uh, I think like m many many applications use the just the plain vanilla kernel TCP. Mm -hmm. um, we didn't really think about doing kernel uh, sender side data copy because uh, in our experiments we consistently saw that the receiver side was the bottleneck, and so we we do want to explore uh, like the performance characteristics if we like eventually like do have some type of uh, zero copy TCP support. Yeah. Um, but we as as it stands like we do not with our Mellanox Connect X5. Okay. Um, and the last comment, just you mentioned ring size, for example. So showing PPS, your packet rate, because it's small ring sizes, your packet rate's going to get crushed. Like the, the ring just simply, you can't process that ring fast enough at, to, to sustain the packet rate. So just a, a, another variable. When you went down to 128, I was like, oof, how could you possibly do a high-speed networking with 128 ring size? And then I know you're trying to do the counter of an 8K ring size, and then what are the negative impacts of doing that? So yeah, so actually we observe that as long like since we're talking about throughput and like we have like larger frame sizes, so with one uh, ring with like one single RX descriptor, you can transfer up to like 9,000 bytes of data. So I think that's why we don't see a drop in performance. And in fact, like 128 is like where we up, like 128 uh, and uh, 1600 um, or 3200 uh, kilobyte of TCP buffer is our opt are our optimal parameters where we see a total throughput a uh, through, uh, throughput per core of 55 gigabytes per second from a single core, and the default parameters are 1024 and 6400 uh, mm -hmm. k. Yeah. So um, we do see uh, our, the throughput going down dramatically when we go to 64. So we just didn't look at 64. We just like varied it from 128 to like. Uh, yeah, and uh, that's the other side of it is the yes. how much buffer you're passing down per write, and yes. um, the window size, the buffering. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thanks. This is good data. So next question is this, and I'm going to actually uh, I have a piggyback question on this, but I'll let you answer this one first. Um, yes, I think, um, I mean, I would say yes, if you just wanted to like, uh, do these benchmark type of things, zero copy would probably like give you, um, like hundred GBPS. Um, and, um, 
there are there, there have been uh, like uh, a lot of work done. Um, I think there was a talk in last year's NetDev, and they, those uh, they, they were able to get like 100 Gbps from a single core using uh, zero copy TCP. Uh, however, um, as it stands, like the um, current like TCP zero copy API requires uh, this hardware offload called header data split, which is not supported in on, on Linux uh, with our NICs. So we couldn't do that, but yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, zero copy would give give you a lot of like throughput with like it. It would be very CPU efficient. Uh, I'm not sure I understood what you said by not supported on Linux and your Nix because it is supported in Linux on most Nix, but well, it's support, supported in the uh, Nix, but in the yeah. Linux open source driver for ConnectX five, it is ah, not supported. I see. That's what so, okay. Yeah. So that that particular nick, okay. So yes. uh, the the follow up question I had was actually on and there's a, co a couple of comments about zero copy RX. The zero copy RX footprint in the DDIO actually will not change. Uh, the place where zero copy RX will make a difference will be in that that distance to when the final copy gets done, right? So there you will not have that issue because any cache eviction will not affect you because you're just doing a page flip. But um, you will still see the impact on the Initial footprint into the DDIO, right? Even in the zero copy case. Um, I mean, assuming that um, you're not touching the data, as you said, like previously, if if you're not touching the data, then uh, and the NIC can write at PCIe bandwidth to the LLC or the DRAM, then you should just be able to get like uh, but, around. But you might end up. Right, but you might end up evicting the RX descriptors instead because they're all in the same spot, right? You're you're contending for the same two by eleven of of uh, map. I, I would think. I mean, that would be an interesting thing to see. Just just that would be um, worth the experiment. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, um, like. Packet metadata is obviously like uh, an important yeah. thing when it comes to like latency and uh, like packet processing in general. Um, I, I'm I'm not really sure because I can like uh, say exactly what effect it would cause. Um, but yeah, it should be inter interesting to see. Yeah. Moving along, next question. Um. Yes. Um. That. That seems to be true. Uh, we do look at uh, outcast type scenarios in in the paper, um, so uh, we have uh, slightly uh, more detail there for the sender side bottlenecks. Yeah. So one one comment in the comment that uh, maybe Eric, you want to say that uh, it's like zero copy is used in Google. It's not a benchmark only thing. It's like the, the authors know a little bit about that feature. Um, okay. Anything else? Any other questions? Did I not anybody I didn't cover? If you had a question that I didn't or missed, please raise your hand. Otherwise, I think we. Uh, okay, here's one more. Um, no, we did not look into cat uh, yet because, uh, like most of the issues we were seeing were from the Nick side, and from from my understanding. Cat cannot like control the amount of cache that a uh, hardware peripheral has access to. If I'm not wrong. Okay, we have uh, we have Jamal on. Yeah, hey, hey uh, you can, can you can hear me, right? Uh, yes. I just want to say that we've set up a table on the lounge for uh, performance discussions. That includes all three talks. If you want to show up there, Subham, I, I hope you can make it. Just go to the lounge. There's a, you'll see a table. It's called, uh, I think, Path Discussions or something. Sorry, that's all okay. I wanted to say. Thanks. Yeah. By, by the way, I saw the Kise showed up as well. Did he want to, Kise, if you want to join or say something or summarize or add any comments, we can add you to the stage. If not, I think we have covered all the questions. So we will be. Finishing this session in 30 seconds. All right, I guess that sounds like it. Well, thank you very much, Shubham. This was actually illuminating and obviously a very important study. We 
hope this will be continued and a lot more data will come out of this. Thank you. Going forward. Thank you.